fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery. Welcome back into the house of mystery. I'm Al Warren. We got Mr. John Copenhaver. How are you doing, John? Oh, I'm doing um, delightful today on this <laughs> fine Friday. <laughs> delightful. That's just delightful. So, so delicious. Delightful. delightful. You have yeah, you're having a yeah. cup of tea with your pinky up. Oh, um, I, that would be nice. Um, sure, but I think I, I wouldn't want to be slurping on air. So <laughs> that would be so delightful. Is it hot over there in your part of the woods? Uh, in Richmond, it is. It is. Yeah, it's pretty darn hot. I w- was up in D.C. midweek driving around, and I went to uh, an event up there um, promoting my book, and it was 111 on the uh, on the car's you know, temperature gauge, and I was like, "This is insane." <laughs> yeah, Arizona, boy. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Well, speaking of hot, got <laughs> one hot author with one hot book. And, um, okay, so now it's the Aaron McKay legal thriller, book four. It's called Nothing But the Truth. Country needs that a lot lately. So, yeah. uh, Robin, Robin Geigel, thank you for coming on the show. Oh, Al, thank you so much for having me. Good to see you, John. Great to see you. Um, and I'm in New Jersey where... It, it's absolutely gorgeous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> were you? I should ask. Were you a, a big fan of Donald Sutherland? Um, you know, I, I wouldn't say a big fan, but but certainly um, he was in some movies that I, I really liked. Obviously, the the movie Mash, Animal House. Uh, he had that role in that, um, and and a few others. So I wasn't a huge fan, but certainly a fan. But he was a really good at um, character. Oh yeah, pulling a character out, and that's kind of what I was I was thinking. And so, when you write a book, and especially when you're writing a series like this is book four, you must think a lot about your characters and how you want them to be and how how realistic they are. Do you, do you have a certain method of doing that? You know, I I really don't, Al. It, it's um, you know, when I conceived of Aaron McKay, but I I wasn't conceiving of, of it as a series. I, I thought it was you know I. I was an unpublished writer at that point in time. Uh, I hadn't, you know, Aaron, by way of sorrows, the first Aaron book was my debut. So when I was writing that, I, I thought I was writing a one book standalone. The characters were important to me. Uh, certainly Aaron was. Aaron is a transgender criminal defense attorney. There was, you know, no one in terms of the legal th- thriller genre that I knew of that was like her. So I certainly thought a lot about her and what she represented. And her partner, her law partner, Dwayne Swisher, is a black man and um, a former FBI agent. So I thought a lot about him and, and how they could interact um, and the intersectionality of the issues that, that they would deal with in, in that book. And, you know, I, I think as the, the book came together, certain characters that have gone through the arc of the four books, uh, you know, clearly some of them are, are um, a little bit more close to, to home in terms of who they are. Um, her boyfriend, uh, Aaron's boyfriend, Mark Simpson, is a character that I thought a lot about in terms of a, a cisgender heterosexual man who finds himself attracted to a trans woman and, and what that was like. And then, of course, Aaron's family, and in particular her mom, Peg McCabe, who I have said right from, you know, the first interview I gave from, from for book one, Peg McCabe is an homage to my mom. Uh, obviously, Peg means a lot to me and the character means a lot to me. How do you work the dialogue between these characters? Like, how do you work that out so that it's realistic? Because they're quite different, each character. Look, I've I've been on this planet for a long time. I'm 71 years old. I, I've been a lawyer for over 47 years. So I think you you get a sense of people 
and who they are and and how they're going to to speak and act uh again just over the course of your lifetime dealing with so many people and so when you envision or when i envision a character i'm thinking about what they look like and where what their background is even if it's not necessarily in the book and and how they're going to react and speak and what their their cadence is going to be and and whether there's a little bit of a dialect to it or not one of the things that I love writing is dialogue um uh, I'm I'm not real good at descriptive passages I'm much better or at least I think I'm much better at dialogue and so to me it has to ring true in terms of who the characters are and, and how they're reacting to a given situation and you know one character is going to react differently to a situation than another and you have to reflect that in the dialogue so you have to know who your characters are and and what their backgrounds are and and how they're going to respond to any given situation. So your premise of the book, let's let's talk about that. What's the basic premise of book 4? Basic premise of book 4 is that a uh black investigative newspaper reporter has been found murdered and the person accused of the crime is a white law enforcement officer. He's a New Jersey state trooper who also happens to be the first out and open gay state trooper and um he is accused of murdering the the journalist um the motive being that um the journalist was working on an exposé of the New Jersey State Police and a rogue group of troopers within the New Jersey State Police called the Lords of Discipline uh if i could kind of digress a little bit uh the the uh the premise or, or the the storyline of the book actually comes from two kind of uh situations that came up i was doing a a panel uh for the new jersey state bar association on book 3 and a lawyer asked me a question as to whether or not erin could ever represent someone who was accused of murdering a trans person and i was like oh that's an interesting question and and i thought about it and i said you know the answer at the time was i don't know let me think about it and i i came to the conclusion that i as a writer couldn't do that um maybe erin as a lawyer could but i as a writer couldn't do it as i mentioned uh dwayne swisher her law partner is a black man you know there's been so much in the news and and in in the world of uh white law enforcement officers uh and their interaction with with the black community with people of color indigenous people the lgbtq plus community that i thought well maybe i could flip that a little bit and what if aaron and dwayne were called upon to represent a white law enforcement officer accused of murdering a black journalist and then the second thread is i happen to have a good friend who was the first out and open gay male state trooper in the New Jersey State Police and we were having brunch one day I was talking about storylines and you know I'm trying to figure out you know what the plot of book 4 is going to be and he said to me google the lords of discipline and I said who and he said the lords of discipline and he said just google it he was still an active member of the New Jersey State Police at that point so he couldn't say too much and so I went home and I googled it and there really was an organization or or a rogue group within the state police or allegedly within the state police you know they went after not only uh citizens in terms of going you know after people for driving while black and and framing people for crimes that they didn't commit but they also went after their own so they went after women state troopers and they went after lgbtq plus state troopers and, and anyone that was not part of that group they went after and so that kind of became the genesis of the story and Aaron and Dwayne are contacted to reach this trooper who is alleged to have murdered the journalist and they initially have to make that decision can Dwayne represent a white man accused of killing a black journalist and then ultimately it's the story of was was this person guilty or were they framed and it's the trial of that case um that is the the main part of the book how important is it for your main characters let's say grow through such a storyline as this or is it the storyline itself like what how do you balance the two like because your character like Aaron has to 
you know, they, it, it, she will grow through this challenge at the same time as the storyline itself develops. Like, where, which is the more important to you, or which do you get more of, and how, how do you balance that? So the, the other storyline that, that's woven through the, all four of the novels, um, but it, again, in this one, and I have to be careful because I don't want to give too many spoiler, spoilers here, <laughs> but at, at the end of book three, Aaron gets engaged to Mark Simpson. Um, and so there's a storyline uh, that goes through this novel, book four, Nothing But the Truth, of their relationship, um, as well as the Mark has a sister, Molly, and she's a lesbian, and she's married to a woman by name of Robin. Go figure out how I came up with the name of that character. <laughs> and and they decide that they want to have a child. So I, I deal with, um, you know, in vitro issues. Um, and so... In all of my books, I have this personal storyline that's woven into um, the the legal thriller part of the storyline, and and I and I like to do that because I think it you know it humanizes um, the characters. They they have a life outside of of being lawyers, like we all do, like I do. You have to balance it carefully because you want to give people what they want, the legal thriller, but you also want to weave in that other storyline. And Al, you, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that when I wrote By Way of Sorrow, the first book, I thought it was a one book standalone. And and they're all written as standalones. And if you pick up book four and you haven't read the other three, it will make perfect sense to you. But if you read them in order, you will see that there is, a, in particular to Erin, an arc to her story and how she grows over the four books uh, not only as a lawyer, um, but also as, as a person in terms of the confidence in who she is, um, because in the first book she had only transitioned a couple of years before that, and now here she is, you know, four years down the road um, from the opening of the first book. And so you have that whole arc to Aaron's story that when I conceived of the first book wasn't there, but as I wrote them, I wove that in to them and and knew kind of where it was going to go. That's so interesting. Whose point of view do you like to write from? Um, I, I mean, the, you know, it's all third-person point of view, so I will flip back and forth between Aaron and Dwayne, although Aaron certainly is, is certainly the main point of view. But I also do, you know, the people who are not necessarily the protagonist, the the antagonist in the, in the book, I, I write from their point of view, and, and sometimes that's a lot of fun, um, you know, to, to get into the people who are on the wrong side and, and get in their heads and what motivates them and why they're doing the things that they're doing. I think I enjoy, you know, for the most part, I enjoy being in, in, Aaron's, in Aaron's head and expressing her point of view, although occasionally... I'm in Peg's point of view, which is uh, Aaron's mom, and, and and that's also fun too because that's like cry, climbing into to my mom and, and and channeling her in some ways. So I have to ask you because I know you're a big Scott Tro fan. Or have, have you been watching the new uh, Presumed Innocent? I am a huge fan of Presumed Innocent. It's one of those things that it's like, oh, I have to do that with the with the launch of this book. I I have finished the first draft of a, um, a a new novel that I'm now in the process of revising that I promised my agent I'd have it to her by June 30th. Well, there's no way I'm going to make it, but I'm trying desperately to make it. And then my day job decided to get real busy. So I just haven't had, have you watched it? Is it good? Yeah, so I, I I do know you have a lot of admiration for that uh, that book, and in fact, as you were talking about your book, is sort of the you know this idea of you know the personal and the professional intersecting in interesting ways. I mean that that book is sort of such a classic example of of that very thing, right? Um, it, yeah. By the way, it is excellent, and I much prefer it. I, it's still in the midst of watching it. It's not fully released yet. I don't believe, but. It's uh, it, I I think it's well done and, uh, and superior to the the '90s film. Yeah, yeah, they just get into it more. It's more he's he's pretty much more likable. Our rusty uh, <laughs> character, 
the central character is. I, I was curious because I, I knew you were a fan, and I knew that sort of had, you know has that intersection of a personal and uh, professional. Do you feel? I know you kind of, in many ways, cover the sort of two different threads of Aaron's existence, but. To what degree do they inform each other or shape each other? How would you sort of describe that in your work? Yeah, I, I have built in to, to all of the novels um, issues that are important to me as a trans woman, both personally and professionally. And, and I, I hasten to add, Aaron is not me. I, I mean, so, I mean, this is not my way of, of trying to secretly, you know, have another life uh, through Aaron. I, I mean, I, I do have lived experiences that are, are similar to Aaron's. So, you know, to me, it, it's been important to to show both the, the professional competence of Aaron, because, you know, as I, I think some people think trans people, there's something wrong with us. And I wanted to show that Aaron is a competent professional attorney at the same time, I want to show that she's a human being, and and she has human issues like we all do, and and I and I think it's important to to put that in there to make a complete character, to show the humanness of the character, and that it's not just you know that she's not just a cartoon character, she's not just a cartoon hero, uh, you know, she's a three dimensional person. Um, that I'm obviously a fictional person, that has flaws, has good points, has struggles, um, and, and tries to deal with her self-doubts that she has. And, and that's like all of us. And I, and I think it's important with any character that they be three-dimensional and real to the point that, you you know, we have space to make them real. There's the professional part, but I want people to see Aaron as a woman who is dealing with all the struggles that we all deal with in life. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think that's true. I mean, we, we tend to treat professionals as if somehow they can just take their human sides off. Or, you know, they just, you know, I know you're controlling your emotion and controlling those things. But the reality is that these things always intersect and, and that makes for interesting storytelling, you know, besides. So I'm always in awe of legal thrillers. I'm in awe of your writing in your book that you can I think it's such a hard thing to to sort of write, like to make I, I know the reality of a lot of legal cases that they don't they're not super exciting necessarily. <laughs> they may have points of excitement, but your job as a thriller writer is to make it exciting. Can you talk a little bit about how you do that or like or even, you know, sometimes when it's been difficult, or I, I just think um, that's so interesting to me. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, you know, I come with, with at it from a, a little bit of, of a bias in the sense that as somebody who has litigated cases for, you know, I've been a lawyer for almost 47, so the first year I was a, a clerk, I wasn't litigating cases, but I've been litigating cases for over 45 years. I find them inherently fascinating um, and, and thrilling in their own right. Um, but as you say, you know, when you when you look at it as an outsider, there, there's so much other stuff that's going on that really is kind of dull and mundane and, and, and really not thrilling. So you have to distill it in a way that you're truly capturing what goes on in a courtroom um, while at the same time not bogging down in, in legalisms and, and boring people with, you know, uh, minutia that really isn't necessary. Obviously, uh, I, as the author, can, can make the case as exciting as I want, but it's also then taking, and I want to be really true to what happens in a courtroom. And and sometimes what what is the most exciting, you know, figuring out, what you're going to do the next day in a courtroom or how you're going to attack a witness that, you know, if you look at a, a trial transcript, you're not going to see. So it's it, you can add that behind-the-scenes look and that, that strategy, the chess game that goes on between lawyers when they're, they're figuring out, okay, what witness do I put on next? You know, how do, how do I take away the sting that I know the other side you know, they're going to score some points on cross. How do I take that away from them? So that, that chess match that goes on in a courtroom, that kind of is fun to write because 
again, as a lawyer, I know it exists. And I know if people watch, you know, courtroom dramas on TV or movies, you know, you kind of get some of that. But I want to I want to bring that to the fore and, and, you know, see people, you know, do a little bit of inside baseball type stuff for people so that they're seeing what really goes on between, you know, a prosecutor and a defense attorney and how the judge is playing into that and what the jury is thinking. So I, I have a lot of fun with it because, again, I, I start from the, the, the bias that it's, it's inherently fun, and, and then I just have to make sure that um, I just don't bog people down in, in stuff that really doesn't advance the story. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. I think that um, I was I was thinking about as I, I was you know preparing to chat with you and and watching Presumed Innocent and doing all this stuff. I guess I have a lot of legal thrillers in my mind. Um, you know, I was like, what, when did legal thrillers become a thing? I mean, I knew that it was like uh, Perry Mason, of course. It, it seems to me like almost in the '90s, like we get a, a lot more. I think that's when Presumed Innocent came out, or the late '80s. I can't remember precisely. I, I, I think it, I think it was the the late '80s, early '90s. I believe it came out before Grisham's uh, A Time to Kill. Maybe I'm jumping ahead, John, and I apologize if I am, but I consider Presumed Innocent to be the the basic you know the well from which the modern legal thrillers sprang yeah yeah uh, you know that that to me is the is the fulcrum you know i had been practicing law you know again for let's say uh, i i forget exactly when it came out but i had been practicing for a while and, and i just remember reading that book and being just totally blown away by it uh, enthralled by by you know what he had pulled off with that book and then either again i i forget the the timeline i i think john grisham's a time to kill uh came out shortly after that um but didn't really catch on till after uh, i'm trying to think what what his first big blockbuster was yeah, I think his 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 first one was the firm, but then the time to yeah. kill was an actual legal. That I don't think the yeah. firm is so much a law a legal thriller as a. Yeah, of. but but what happened is when when a when a time to kill came out, nobody read it. Yeah, yeah, I think they printed five thousand copies, and then of course the firm comes out, and it's a huge blockbuster made into a huge movie, and everybody goes back to his back catalog. And that's when I read A Time to Kill. And who am I to say anything about John Grisham? But for me, I think that's my favorite John Grisham book. Um, it is such a great story. Yeah, actually, it's my favorite that I've read. So I, I guess I, I agree with you. Yeah, yeah. And it's fascinating. I just think it's interesting, legal throws. I, I kept on wondering if it has anything to do with we started getting televised legal cases in the uh, in the 90s and why our interests, you know, I don't know. Anyway, this is me thinking. But... I, I just, it's an interesting, it's very... If, if you were right, though, if you go back to early television, you're right about, I mean, Perry Mason yeah. were, were books before were the series, but how popular the Perry Mason show was. Yeah. Um, so I think it predates, you know, Grisham and, and Thoreau. Um, there's been a, a fascination, but you're right. With, with the advent of court TV and everything else, I think everybody's much more involved in, in watching real life legal drama. Yeah, stuff that feels real, right? <laughs> Versus Perry Mason's kind of legal light. <laughs> now, you deal with a lot of sensitive subjects, but su su subjects that are very important um, and important to you. Um, let's talk about that, um, how you choose the areas you're going to go into and what you're going to talk about within the plot. Each book kind of had a, a central theme in terms of not only what the the arc of the story was, but about the, as you said, Al, about the issues that I, I wanted to deal with by way of sorrow involves a young 19-year-old black trans woman who's accused of murdering the only son of the richest and most powerful politician in the state of New Jersey. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, kind of juxtapose this black trans young black trans sex worker with Aaron and and how even though they were both trans people how different their lives were because of their circumstances um and, and not to say you know not in any way making any judgments about it but to show that even with trans people, there are people who have privileges. And, and I consider myself one of those people who's had a very privileged life. And so I wanted to show 
you know, here's someone who is also trans but doesn't have the same privileges and benefits that Aaron has. And Sharice Barnes, who's the, the young black woman, is incarcerated in a men's jail. And I, and that was an issue that I had actually litigated. Not Sharice's case, obviously, but the issue of the incarceration of, of trans women. Uh, and so I wanted to deal with that issue. Survivor's Guilt, which is book two, deals with the issue of the exploitation of young LGBTQ kids. So many of those kids um, are homeless because they, they, you know, have such horrible home lives when either they come out or they're out it. So I, I wanted to explore those issues. Remain Silent, which is book three, I, it, I call it my angry book because there was, you know, it was at that point in time when all the vitriol against the, the trans community was really coming to the fore. And, and I wanted to do an exploration of trans people as I knew them over my lifetime. So there's some people who, some trans characters in that book that are, would literally be my age. And then an 11 year old trans girl whose dad gets custody um, because the, his ex-wife, the, the character's mom, is supportive of her, and dad is able to get custody of his trans daughter to put her through conversion therapy. So again, I wanted to deal with those issues because I, I think they're, they're so important. Um, and then in, in Nothing But the Truth, wanted to deal with the, the homophobia, the transphobia within law enforcement, and at the same time, it, again, uh, it, it gets a little difficult because there's a spoiler here, deal with issues in terms of reproductive rights and alternative uh, means of, of coming up with families, uh, in particular for LGBTQ plus families. So, you know, those are all issues that, you know, for me are important to the LGBTQ plus community and to the trans community, and so... You know, when I when I'm coming up with a plot, I, I want to be able to weave those issues into the plot seamlessly, and so that's why they're part of the storyline. These are very important issues, and a lot of the issues that you you talk about, you get into and write about, you must learn a lot. Uh, you know, and working out the characters' feelings and and how they act and interact and how people are and stuff. Uh, what does it do for you? Each one of these books that you write. How does it change you, or what, what do you think happens to you? I'd like to think I come away smarter. Um, I like to think I, I come away because I do characters who I don't have the lived experience of. I, I use sensitivity readers to make sure that you know when I when I write a 19 year old black trans you know sex worker, that's not my lived experience. So I want to make sure it's authentic, and so I hope that. By talking to people, to by dealing with my sensitivity readers, that I grow as a person, that I have a better understanding, um, and that my characters accurately represent that understanding. I hope that I, you know, certainly in terms of nothing but but the truth, um, I have a, a a really good friend and colleague who's um, a a lawyer who has been doing. Uh, family planning for LGBTQ plus couples for decades. And, and uh, his name is Bill Singer. And Bill was absolutely instrumental in helping me to understand these issues and hopefully to get them right, because it's not an area of the law that I practice in. But again, you want to make sure that from a story point of view, you get the law and the issues and even the medical procedures necessary you get them correct and, and people like bill um were instrumental to me in, in terms of learning these issues uh in terms of you know some of the books have dealt with dna issues and, and again i've never had the, the need to use that but you know you, you talk to people who do and you learn and you make sure that you get it right so for me that it's been an educational experience each one of the books uh, i've enjoyed learning and, and hopefully growing in terms of, of my own knowledge of the issues. Do you, do you think about the reader as you write the books? And, and or is the reader kind of over your shoulder as you put it together? Yes, I think of the reader. I write the book that I want to write. Although my 
main protagonist, Aaron, is a transgender woman. You know, as John mentioned, you know, my my love of, of Scott Turow's books. I'm hoping that the same people that will pick up and read a Scott Turow book or read a John Grisham book or read a Lisa Scanalini book, you know, that, that cisgender, heterosexual reader who loves a legal thriller, I want them to like my book. So I am not trying to beat anyone over the head with the issues that we've talked about that I, I've woven in. I want that cisgender straight person to read the book and go, oh, this is a great legal thriller. So that, that part out, I, I do have the reader in mind in that, in that I don't want to be preaching to people. I want the, the message that I'm trying to get across to be subtle. Uh, you know, the, the Mary Poppins method, you give them what they want, that spoonful of sugar, um, which is the legal thriller, and then hopefully the medicine goes down a little bit easier. So that, that, that message that I'm trying to get across in terms of the issues, in ter- you know, dealing with LGBTQ plus issues and dealing with trans issues is part of the story, and they're learning as they read and enjoy the legal thriller. So uh, that's the way that I think of the reader. The story is what I want to write about, but I want to make it palatable to a wider audience. Um, because if nobody reads my books, there, there's no reason to write them. You, know, you do this really beautifully. I think that is one of the reasons I really admire them, is that you do, as you're reading a book, get a sense that you're just getting a legal thriller, and these are the issues of the legal thriller, and these characters are dealing with. You know, it's... And uh, it's not didactic. It's just, it's natural to the, and I, you're right. I think it, these books are, anyone who likes legal thrillers are going to love these books. What, you know, I imagine how you feel about book banning. Why do you think it's happening and um, where are we going with this whole craziness? Oh, John, if I had the answer to that, <laughs> boy, look where we are in this country uh, in terms of LGBTQ plus issues um, and racial issues and immigration issues and religious issues, uh, there's such fear and fear-mongering going on. This sense uh, of some people that if you prevent someone from reading about these issues, that somehow they will disappear, that like if you don't let people read books with you know, queer characters, that suddenly there's not going to be any queer people. I mean, from, you know, our perspective, we know that makes absolutely no sense, and yet that's what people seem to think, that if they can prevent a 15-year-old kid from reading a book with a gay man main character, that if the if the kid who's reading it is truly gay, that somehow if you can prevent them from reading it, they, they'll never come out, like... That's insane. It's insanity. Um, you know, we all know that, you know, we are who we are. Um, you know, I didn't choose to be a trans woman any more than other people choose to be cis women. We just are. And yet people think if they could prevent that knowledge from going out into the world, somehow trans people will disappear or somehow Black people will become subservient again if you, you know, ban books that that deal with anti-racist theory. It's mind-boggling to me that here we are in 2024 and we're talking about book banning. Uh, it, it's just inconceivable to me that that this is the the place where we are. But we are, and and. and I can't explain why we are. I think it's people's desire to um, make sure that thoughts outside their own aren't heard by anyone. If you're that cisgender, straight, Christian person, you don't want anyone else's viewpoints to be heard for fear that it might resonate with someone. What can I say? It's, uh, it's horrible that we're living through this. Uh, it doesn't work. We all know it doesn't work. Uh, the the books that get banned are the are the ones that kids in high school want to read um, because you've you've just made it you know you know that's the rebellious age and and if you tell you know a, a 15 year old don't do something what's the first thing they're going to do whatever you told them not to do right. <laughs> you ban a book and that's the book they want to read okay why don't you want me to read this I guess I'm not 
smart enough to figure out what people hope to accomplish. But uh, it, it's happened through the ages. It's happening again. And, um, and, and hopefully we'll get through this uh, and, and get to a saner point in time where everybody's point of view can be expressed and can be expressed freely uh, without fear that, that somebody's going to be offended just because they're gay or, or they're black or they're indigenous or they're Muslim or they're Jewish. I, I mean, you know, uh, we all need to be exposed to all different kinds of point of view. The more we're exposed to people who have different lived experiences from ourselves, the better off we're going to be. Yeah, and it's so true. It's like <laughs> I, I, you know, grew up in the '80s and early '90s and read exactly zero, uh, at least you know, openly queer characters in any books I read. It did not stop me from being gay whatsoever. And you're right. And now the access—I mean, you can't even—I mean, you can get the access to books is so much easier than it ever was, or just information in general than it was when we were growing up. So this idea of banning books seems. Um, a uh, ludicrous attempt to seize control over something that will never actually occur. Um, but uh, but it's it's disappointing. You know the 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 whole thought that you know there there's trans people because of the internet or because of peer pressure <laughs> or or it's hysterical because you know you you said you grew up in the eighties. I grew up in the fifties, John. <laughs> 50s and 60s. There was no internet. I thought I was the only person world that was like me and yet i knew at the age of four that that i was supposed to be a girl so you know the, this thought that you know people are influenced by popular culture or by peer pressure is ludicrous well i mean hopefully they ban my books and then they, they never want to, want to read them right you see <laughs> like it's reverse self- psychology yeah. Uh, marketing yeah it's <laughs> my new marketing scheme you know well robin what is it you hope a reader takes away from your book then? Again, I hope, Al, that they're entertained. I, I hope when they when they get to the end of the book, they're going, whoa, that, I, I didn't see that coming, or oh, wow, that, that was, you know, that was a lot of fun. That was a, a fun ride. Um, you know, so that, that's one takeaway that they have. The other, as I said, is, you know, through Aaron, uh, in particular Aaron, I hope people come away with an understanding of, of what it's like to be a transgender woman in this country uh, and and have a better understanding of that. Uh, you know, so often, you know, it's easy to dislike or, or, or you know, profess your disdain for, for something that you don't understand. It gets a lot harder when there's a human face on it. And so, you know, my hope is that even though Aaron is obviously not human in that, in the, in a literal sense, but I, I hope that as a character, she puts a face on an issue and that people walk away and go, Oh, I understand those issues a little bit better now. I have a greater understanding of it. I, I have a, uh, an appreciation for what trans people go through. I have an appreciation of, of what it's like to be trans in this country that I didn't have before I read the book. Um, and, and, you know, look, I know we're, you know, we, we all are told don't, don't look at your reviews, don't read good reads, don't do anything like, you know, watch your Amazon reviews or anything like that. And, and I, for one, you know, ignore that and I take a look at them. And uh, there is nothing more rewarding than to see a review in which somebody says, I knew nothing about these issues when, you know, I picked up whatever one of my books uh, they picked up. And um, I now have a better understanding of it. And I appreciate you know, what it means to be trans in a way that I didn't appreciate it before. Nothing means more to me than that, um, because in, in that way, I, I've accomplished some good uh, in terms of not just entertaining people, but giving them something, a, a message to take away with it. Now, social media. Now, do you like readers to contact you? Do you have a social media website, anything like that set up? Yeah, I, I, I Al, if you do the math, when I when I said that I you know I grew up in the fifties, you you'll figure out that I'm you know seventy one years old. Um, so I am not the most proficient at social media. 
Um, I see John on social media all the time. I'm so jealous of his Are uh, you? <laughs> his abilities on social media. But but I I am on uh, I am on Twitter or X, whatever we want to call it these days. I am on Instagram. Um, and I, I do try to post and, and get word out there. Uh, and I, I do have a Facebook page, but somehow I missed the Facebook, you know, train when it left the station. And so I'm still trying to play, fa- uh, catch up with Facebook. So I, I am not, uh, great there. But yeah, I, I am always thrilled when, when people reach out, um, you know, on Twitter. Um, or Instagram, and, and, you know, if I can find my way and, and figure out how to do things on Facebook when people reach out on Facebook. Um, so it, it's it's always wonderful from to hear from people that have read my books. Uh, um, you know, it, it's, again, I think one of the reasons why we do it is is to know that, you know, it, our books made a difference in somebody else's life. I appreciate you being on. We'll have to get your book up. We'll have your social media. We'll have things so people can find you. And uh, there we go. The book, Nothing But the Truth, an Aaron McCabe legal thriller in its book four. Don't miss it. Robin Geigel, thank you for being here. Thank you, Al. Thank you so much, John. Pleasure. Thank you both. It, it's been an honor to be here. This has been a production of the House of Mystery Radio Show. To find out more about our show, guests, or hosts, go to our website at houseofmysteryradio.com.